the biography that Bradford produced in 1869 is a very sketchy work. Uh, Bradford produced it in haste before she herself was heading off uh, on a trip to Europe, and the purpose was to earn money. So um, uh, the title, which is Scenes of the Life of Harriet Tubman, it really does capture what the, the book is. It's um, um, bits and pieces, little snippets of aspects of Harriet Tubman's life, of moments in her life, and it's rather disjointed. So um, we might desire a narrative that kind of goes all the way through connecting different uh, parts of her life, but that's not what this source is. Um, one thing that it does do well, though, is that, uh, probably in part because Bradford was so rushed, she includes all kinds of uh, additional information about Tubman. So letters that were written uh, to or about Tubman, um, uh, quotations from newspaper articles about Tubman also appear in the book. So it is um, a collage in many ways of Tubman's life that, that allows the reader to get uh, beyond Bradford's narrative and to look at some other primary sources from the time also. There are, there are many moving stories in the book. And one of the most moving aspects of the source is that we get these stories more or less in Harriet Tubman's voice. Now I say more or less because this is an as told to account. Um, we have to trust Sarah Bradford to uh, relate this to us faithfully. And we weren't there, so we don't know if she did. Um, Sarah Bradford also renders Harriet Tubman's stories in uh, Bradford's approximation of a black dialect, which is um, problematic, I think, for us looking back at the source if we try to imagine how it was that Harriet Tubman might have really sounded. Um, but that being said, there are some really moving moments in the narrative that help to kind of um, fill in the picture of Tubman's life and to kind of put flesh on the bones of the myth of her life. So this is the moment where uh, Tubman first escapes and uh, Bradford describes this as Tubman passing the magic line from slavery to freedom. And this is what Tubman says about that moment. I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person now that I was free. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields and I felt like I was in heaven. So this to me is um, such a powerful um, representation of Tubman's feeling of her emotional life um, at this incredible turn of her life story. And this is something we don't often get access to uh, when we're trying to think about uh, historical figures, is how, how was it that they actually felt about certain moments in their life? I think with Harriet Tubman, um, we think about her after this moment. We think about her as the Moses of her people, who's got that pistol and who's you know, going um, through the swamps with her long skirts to take um, 10, 20, 30, 60, and Bradford actually says 300, um, that's been debated, but to take all of those slaves to freedom. We don't see her as the young woman who was first escaping and who felt this incredible sense of joy and uh, relief and the promise of a new kind of life. But even though we get this sense of uh, incredible joy from Tubman at this moment, uh, immediately we see that she's going to face a complicated future. Three paragraphs after she talks about um, feeling so um, happy that she is free, she talks about her extreme loneliness in this new state. And she says, I had crossed the line of which I had so long been dreaming. I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land. So in this moment, we get um, a real sense of um, a dual emotional response that, that Tubman is feeling. The joy at freedom and also the despair of loneliness and the despair of knowing that people that she loves are still enslaved. So we look at Harriet Tubman uh, as an example of someone who has been described as this kind of sort of heroic uh, mythic figure, but who was a real woman who had all kinds of struggles in her emotional life um, with her first husband, for example, um, with, with poverty later on in life, for example. And I think that's one thing the students are surprised about, to think about Harriet Tubman as a real person who had a host of vulnerabilities. But another thing that surprises students about this book, and I think that troubles them about this book, is that Harriet Tubman was living and working in a particular context. Uh, when she first escaped, she was not yet 
hooked into the Underground Railroad network. But within a couple of years, she was. And she was working with white abolitionists and black abolitionists to free other slaves. Um, there were a number of relational issues that came into her sort of movement into this new community. And I think one of the things that students feel frustrated about is the way that Harriet Tubman talks about white people. The prime audience um, would have been people who had been involved in the abolitionist movement, um, especially in Auburn, New York, where um, Harriet Tubman was, was really beloved, and um, also in the Northeast. And Bradford says that with the first edition of this book, she does not have uh, hopes for a wide readership, mm -hmm. but she really just wants to sell enough copies so that uh, Tubman can raise uh, money to live on. And with the second edition of the book that was published in 1886, uh, Bradford sort of enlarges her uh, intention for the narrative. And I think you can see that in the changes she makes to the book itself. It's much more organized. She collects many more letters, attesting to the importance of Tubman's story. And by the second version in 1886, uh, Bradford seems really committed to the idea that she wants to, um, to set Harriet Tubman's story into the memory of the nation. And letter writers um, whose, whose words are also um, published in the second edition say the same thing, that they are worried that this woman might actually fall out of memory and that this book is important to keep her in people's minds.